so it's my first time talking at DEF CON, so just bear with me. Um, my talk is a bit about all the supply chain and all the areas in, around the car. So I saw lots of, lots of talks are talking about the vehicle itself and, and like how to hack into Canvas and how to hack into through the different areas. But my, my expertise and where I came from is from outside the ecosystem, from, from the areas beside the car. So I will talk about this in my talk. So a bit about me. So this is, this is me. I work for Simotive. It's a company partially owned by Volkswagen. Uh, what I do in my company is we do lots of stuff. We do lots of end-to-end -end security testing. And what I mean is like really end-to-end, -end, like going from, from the vehicle itself and hacking into a vehicle, but also hacking into different IT environments and trying to go through these IT environments towards the vehicle in different ways. And I will show you part of my, the ways that I do. But then we also go into the components themselves and, and we mainly focus on research in order to build security products for the different companies. So I have here different, different concepts I built. Uh, partially I, I built them, partially the company did. And it's just, this is what I do in my day job. More about me. From the age of 15, I was uh, playing with robotics. I was uh, winning contests around, uh, if you know, the Trinity firefighting contest, or the first uh, the NASA, uh, there was a NASA competition. So I was playing around with robotics from very, from when I, when I was very young. I participated in bug bounties inside car hacking. Different, I, we won uh, the most bugs awarded last year in a private car, uh, car hacking event. And most important of all, last year I was on vacation. I took my four-year-old daughter and my wife and just went on one-year vacation in Southeast Asia. So that was uh, very fun. And I came back. So it's uh, good. A bit of a disclaimer about what I can say and I cannot say. So because I work with all these different companies, I have lots of NDAs and lots of stuff. Nothing in my presentation exposes any of my clients. And I want to really go into technical areas and uh, so I didn't put any name dropping of any client or anything. And this is um, very important for me to, so you will understand, like I have lots of examples I cannot show you. Uh, so I'm trying to put the examples that I can show you over inside my presentation. So if we start a bit, we look at different connectivity evolutions. The, the vehicle industry is moving from a very unconnected area to a connected area in different, different fields which are connected in, some, in, different, in different types of areas. For instance, the keys. In the past, we had this very old key that, that didn't have any digital protection. We very fast went into getting keys that are digital, that have a mobilizer and have, a, and have a RFID and a different types of protection. They are not good. You can ask Leonard if he's here. He hacked uh, most of them. But then they're getting better and better. But one thing is we need to remember we have lots of suppliers working with us. So each key of this has the production key, the, the, the physical key itself is building, but also the digital, like uh, Siemens and uh, Lear and uh, Bosch and Conti are uh, creating the, all these uh, issues that you need to connect with the keys. And we are getting even more into the connectivity with the iPhone or Android. So we, we are trying to move the keys towards the mobile phones. And this gives us more connectivity issues. We want to now have a trust with Apple and a trust with Google and a trust with different mobile providers like Verizon. And we have all of this connectivity going on in the life of the key. If we look at charging, it's the same happening. Well, we have the old bottles. Uh, this, when I was in Thailand, I saw lots of bottles and lots of uh, gasoline bottles. But when, then we go to pumps and we also have a plug-in charge and uh, different capabilities of the charging uh, models. And now today we are having NFC and different uh, charging providers that are not part of the OEM. There are different third-party suppliers that you, you pay to them through Apple Pay or through uh, the credit cards. And then you have all this connectivity together. Again, in diagnostics, I go fast. We have the, the old diagnostics area. 
this is old engine diagnostics. We went into OBD. OBD diagnostic, the garage and the different um, service providers want to connect to your car, but then they have this device, and this device is also connected to the internet. So when, when it, it wants to download data, new data, so how can I diagnose my car? So I connect it through the garage support. So the garages have support, and the, it is a new... Uh, the right to fix my own uh, my own car so I can download part of the software so I'm getting connected over here and now in the future cars are getting into remote diagnostics so I have diagnostic over IP so when I want to di diagnose my car I just need to have uh, to approve a third party company or the OEM company in order to uh, give access to my car that it already has 4G access and is able to diagnose my car automatically so this is we are getting more and more connected and we are getting over to a way that we have different types of players inside. So we have insurance companies and we have content providers that have give web apps and different, uh, different applications, media. We have the repair shops, we have fleet companies that have like different fleet management solutions. And of course we have the driver and the owner that he wants to connect his phone into the car. But then we also have the V2X and V2V and we have cars talking with cars and the Bluetooth telematics and we have this whole mess of connectivity happening in a very short time span. And this is really interesting for me. And if I'm looking, I did a very 2D simplified overview of what's, what I see as a, um, a connectivity area inside the digital key. So we have this key and we have the phone. Like let's say we have digital phone, but then the phone has access to a TSM enrollment from the mobile chip. The OEM doesn't own the phone and cannot enroll it by itself the key, so it will have to trust the mobile chip OEMs. So the mobile chip OEMs are connected to the OEM cloud. The OEM cloud needs to be monitored and needs to be accessed by the OEM IT, so there's connections over there through VPN or a few different other areas. The OEM IT has connections to the production plants. And we have third parties that most of the OEM companies are now using third party. Uh, I say third party, but sometimes it's just like second tier companies like Bosch or like Lear or like whatever company it is, but we have also fleet management services and different startups starting to aggregate data. And we have all of this mesh of access in order inside our um, companies. Furthermore, we have this production plants and different stuff are like also 3D. So we have different continents, we have different, uh, different continents have different technology. And it's uh, very hard to secure this ecosystem. It um, came very fast and it's very hard to secure it. So a bit about technologies, I see that we have lots of MQTT and HTTP connections to the, from the car to the OEM cloud. We have uh, just-in-time connections, we have SSH connections, we have REST APIs through the third parties to the OEM chips, uh, OEM um, through the mobile OEMs. But then we have HTTP connections and WebSocket and different propriety connections. So this is a hacker's paradise. You can start playing with all of the different stuff. So one of my thesis and one of my th thoughts that I'm looking at is that this is a normal car cloud like that talks with all these vehicles. And now let's say I own the cloud. And if I can own the cloud, I can send over the droplets to the different vehicles. And if I can uh, send over the updates to the different vehicles, I can send and create all the vehicles to go into the evil cloud. This is like my personal doomsday scenario. I hope that we will never get to that uh, because this is a total recall of all vehicles. Or I don't know uh, what else we can do. But if we start to go further, so I want to start show you how to attack the, this area and how I I play around in, with stuff. So first of all, I will want to start searching for clues, and this is a regular recon, like looking in different embedded, applica embedded uh, devices and applications, the internet, and uh, different resources, uh, NISTF on the internet also is a good clue to getting information about the automotive area. So at first, what I want to do, I want to attack the cloud, but in order to attack the cloud and attack everything, I want to go to the area that is 
least probable that nobody will start hacking in, uh, from it. And this is low level. If I get off the chips, I, I, get, I, I get the passwords and I get different URL and backend endpoints from the chips uh, after I read them in JTAG and different capabilities, I can have secret keys and access to the cloud services. So I would just like get like Amazon URLs, S bucket, S3 buckets, different uh, different communication layers that the chip is talking with the OEM, or with the third party, or with the supplier, or with uh, whoever I'm targeting. And this is a very basic because nobody has access to it, or only you guys have access to it. Then usually they don't protect this, these endpoints. And this is, uh, or even if they protect, sometimes the secret keys and uh, are inside uh, over here inside the chip. Uh, also, HSMs you can break the HSM in uh, different areas, and it's fun to look at it. Other places is like APKs. So I was starting. I started downloading different APKs and different applications inside. Like uh, I saw a Bash Interact Driver or like uh, eFleet Mobile or different uh, different applications that are not connected to the OEM, but are connected in some way. And then I started like looking for different uh, backend URLs, I can start hacking into them. So what I did, eventually I created like a, there's an open source uh, library over here, LibSearch, that what it does, it downloads all of the APKs that I want, and it uh, extracts all the metadata, all the resources into it, and, and puts them into Elasticsearch so I can search easily, like resources, uh, the searches uh, over here, you can see the like uh, URLs and resources, but I also found passwords and secret files and like Twitter APIs and stuff like that inside. Uh, actually, what is interesting is the WeChat. The WeChat secret uh, actually has API payment capabilities and like you have, yeah, it's not only a messaging uh, app, it, it has ma ma much more uh, stuff over there. So I won't show you everything over here because uh, some uh, are confidential and I cannot talk about them, but I found a lot of stuff over here. Um, but more if I'm looking for different endpoints. So I use DNS dumpster, but I also just uh, sometimes run uh, my own list of subdomain searching, and I found so much domains of the different companies. So I didn't try to hack them, but you can just, each one of them, you can, you can start recon, starting understanding which uh, languages, programming languages are over here, and then understanding what do you want to attack. But not only the endpoints, I would also go to the suppliers themselves. But this is, uh, sometimes you get redirected to different uh, sub-suppliers through these domains. But using Shodan is also a possibility. In Shodan, I looked for like Autosar. Autosar is a very, uh, it's, uh, I don't know how to call it, it's like, um, Method in uh, or uh, compliance in uh, it for developing stuff for developing uh, stuff for ECUs. So the whole industry uses it. Um, if there's someone for Autosar here, actually it was pretty nice because I found some passwords of them, uh, so I can access. I didn't use them, but uh, but then you can find also Continental and different other. Like I saw some scatter devices, some uh, uh, some devices that was interesting and different uh, IPs. And this is another way to go get in. But what's most interesting is that you can just ask for all of the subdomains. You don't need to go start scanning because NASTF has all of the uh, right to repair um, components, software components that I want to, in order for me to diagnose my car. So if I want to diagnose my car and I want to have access to different, uh, I can like Bendex commercial vehicle systems, I can uh, access over there or Aston Martin. And it has different softwares I can download. And with the softwares, I, I can uh, find, again, backend connectivities because these softwares usually work with a backend. And then if I try to hack into the backend, I can get more information about all these uh, different areas. So I was uh, looking inside the uh, different, uh, I saw software updates. I saw diagnostic software. You can buy them. You can download them at uh, different forums, like different... Uh, Hacker forums or uh, diagnostic forums. There's lots of uh, car, car forums of uh, like hobby car makers that uh, you can download and uh, illegal uh, tech, uh, illegal diagnostic software. And in this di uh, diagnostic software, you can find lots of backend endpoints and lots of keys and secrets into the different areas. So 
but what eventually I did, I built a big dictionary of uh, lots of words and lots of stuff that are from these different areas. And I started searching them on the deep web, on, the, on different open source uh, areas. So, I don't know how much of you know GitHub, but in GitHub you can, when you delete stuff, you, know, you don't really delete them. So, I like to lo look and uh, what I like to do usually is uh, I go to GitHub and I look in the comments, I deleted secret keys and my com the company target I want to look at. So I find lots of the commits that they deleted and you can see the change, you can see the change itself over here that the change request that they deleted the secret keys but they still have them and they didn't remove them and they didn't deprecate the keys and it's just over there. So you can start looking at different stuff and uh, connecting to the backend services and it's uh, pretty fun. So I found a Terraform, a Terraform uh, code Terraform code is a way to create your own infrastructure inside this ter Terraform. I found a secret in the sub ID of one of the clients I was looking for and was targeting. And uh, this was one of the suppliers I found over here from, from this area. So it wasn't one of the OEMs, it was a supplier of these OEMs. So this code gave me eventually access to about 100 servers around inside the supplier. And at first it was that, it, this was a test Terraform, but this same Terraform gave me access also to production environments. So I now had production environment access, I had full root access to a different 100 uh, environments. And this is like a good place that I, w I like to be. So I'm now inside one of the third parties, one of the suppliers. And, uh, is, and this was uh, one of the diagnostic services inside uh, this uh, specific uh, example. But I want to go further, I want to go and uh, hack into the OEM cloud. Now because the, tr the trust between the third party and the OEM cloud is very, uh, they trust each other and uh, the, this is a technology going back a decade ago, two decades ago. So eventually I just like found the FTP open, I scanned, I started scanning the OEM cloud from inside and found the FTP open, HTTP open and next thing I know I have a shell access on one of the one of the servers inside the OEM cloud itself. So inside the OEM cloud, I now have access and I'm trying to think out where should I go. And this is a real question because I can go start lateral expansion inside the OEM cloud and go start looking at different stuff, but what I learned from the automotive industry is that you have the monitoring servers. Like they like to monitor everything. So. What you want to do, or what I usually like to do, is go after the monitoring servers, the, the development servers, the different uh, areas, and this is why I am focusing on the monitoring server. So from here, what I found out that the server that I hacked into had like, it was a non-critical server. It wasn't connected to any production areas. It wasn't connected to any interesting stuff. But the monitoring server did log in into my server every midnight. It logged in into my server, it ran, ran some code and then got, got the result and fetched it back into its uh, monitoring capabilities so they can show uh, the IT what, what's happening. And this was very interesting because now the question is how does it log in into my server and can I use it some way? So I replaced my SSH server and I did a S-trace and I found out that every midnight it connects to all of the servers and I have the password of the, uh, of the monitoring server that is connecting to me and is connecting to all other servers beside me. So this is pretty nice, this is a, it took me one day. Actually it was a very fun, interesting area. In this particular area, the password when I tried it the next day was, was wrong. And why it was wrong? Because they had a policy on the passwords to change the password every day. So they put a date as the password, like the company name and then the date uh, and uh, then every day it was just changed the date so I knew exactly what was the password the next day and I got in. So I have access to lots of different areas over in the IT area and I have different access to the OEM and they're also in the production plant uh, a bit. And this is like I don't, I, the monitoring server did uh, when I connected it and I saw it, it did have different, like very specific areas, it also wanted to monitor production. 
And this is interesting because you don't want to have the IT area and the old cloud area connected to the production, but the, oh, the monitoring server does want to monitor everything. So if you have one monitoring server that monitors everything, that you will behave and you will be able to jump into production a bit. So now I'm trying to look what I want to do. So I'm inside the room and I want to like look I'm looking all around, I'm looking inside the, the different areas and I'm trying to find what is my targets, what, what do I want to do now without I'm inside this automotive area cloud. So most companies use jump servers. This is a very secure way to access, uh, um, to give suppliers access to different uh, things they want. So when I want to access, um, when I want to give a supplier access to some uh, web server of mine or uh, other, other web server over here, you see lots of IE. So it's good, I like IE. And when I give them this, uh, the access, uh, they have access to a terminal server, but this is not, I don't give them access only to our uh, Internet Explorer. This is Citrix. So the first thing I do usually, I try to break out of the Internet Explorer. I try to break out of different stuff. Usually it's pretty easy. You just uh, go to file open, go to uh, find a command, and you open it. Nowadays it's a bit more harder. You need to find different or PowerShell tricks or different uh, FTP. Nobody knows about FTP. If you go open an FTP console, you uh, press enter, uh, the exclamation mark runs code. So you can just like use that. There's different methods of uh, getting into and when you when you get access to the Citrix server you can find everything all the suppliers are connected over there all the different companies go through this jump servers and this like I, when you own this you own everything but what I found out looking inside my network is I found like a server connecting with lots of lots of different printers like I had 100 printers connected to the server and I asked myself why why should I have a server connected to so many printers? And after investigating and understanding the reason why, inside the factory, in order to know which part you want to install into the vehicle, you need to print out a barcode or a QR code and they scan it. So this is the printers that you print out the QR codes and then you scan it and then they, you know what part you want to take and you put it into the into the other part, like if it's a door, you put it into the chassis. So what I did, I did a POC, I did a POC over here, I printed a different QR code, or this was in another country, I printed a Pikachu, and I showed them how I can, um, how can I disrupt the printer. What's interesting over here, that also if I disable one printer, I basically disable the production line. The production line will stop working. If one place and one printer stops working, the whole line will stop. This is how production line works, it's a line. So um, this is a pretty interesting target. Uh, I also have lots of other targets, like web-based targets that yeah, I can find. But I'm looking for robotics, and I like robotics. Robotics, the whole shop floor is a full of robotics. And usually because there's a rule, you do never stop production. Never do something in production, so you never upgrade production also. You never uh, do changes. And for instance, I had some, pro uh, some robots I wanted to hack, so I looked up uh, inside the web, uh, different forums, and just saw, use this administrator password, this, uh, this user administrator, this password, and the fun thing about this is that they cannot change it, because this is hard-coded into the device. And you will uh, to give, to uh, send a supplier to change this password, it's almost impossible. And to change stuff in production, it's also, also almost impossible. So for this reason, this is the password of the, and it cannot change. Maybe some in the future they will change. Maybe there will be different uh, stuff. And different robots have different passwords and different uh, backdoors, like support backdoors. But even if you cannot find, usually what I do, I find out who installed the robot itself and which supplier installed it and try username and password as the supplier name. It works 50% of the time. The other 50% you need to add a one, two, three, four. <laughs> so this is, a, this is an area. Another area I like is uh, development. So if I'm inside the office IT area, I want to go to development. In development, I find different areas about connectivity projects. Like I was looking around uh, the whole day and found like different areas. And then 
private keys and uh, this is like a live private key of some kind of update Apple before I told you the key is like uh, we are talking about key so this is like uh, some kind to update the Apple certificate in order to have access to it but then if I continue and I saw like some IoT hub connections to go over there and with together with this key I found out I got access to lots of different uh, this was over MQTT, uh, so I subscribed to this MQTT endpoint and I got lots of different devices coming to me. So now I'm monitoring all the devices and I'm just like uh, seeing and uh, writing, uh, seeing all the live vehicles that are uh, on the system right now. And this is not even from production, this is from devel development areas. Development areas have weaker passwords, have developers, they don't like security so much, so it's pretty interesting to see. So I found a connectivity organization a bit. I found the stuff on desktops. Uh, so I'm just like playing around the network now. I own the network. I have like different stuff. I have uh, even memorable words and favorite school subjects and the IoT admin and different like uh, stuff over here. But in the main thing, like what I'm looking at is that we are getting connected. All of the different companies, if we're looking at Bosch or uh, over here, I put FCA, but all of the different companies over here have connectivity areas and they're becoming connected and they are relying on these suppliers and they're relying on different other uh, third party vendors to help them uh, build their whole ecosystem. Nobody does it by themselves. They do it by or Microsoft or uh, uh, um, Amazon or uh, Continental or Bosch or Lear or uh, whoever or the other third, the small, small third party vendors are looking, are helping them uh, connect everything. And we have all these connections, the insurance companies and the vehicles, and the, everything is becoming connected. And because of this, this you need to look at a more general approach and to understand how to secure this stuff. How, how do we secure this ecosystem that we got into over here? So a bit about my conclusions over here. It's important to understand like the whole ecosystem, to look at this stuff. Not Usually when a client comes to me and wants me to secure stuff, he wants me to look over just in one place. I want you to secure this ECU. I want you to secure this backend endpoint. I tell him I want to decide my own. I want to start research and understand exactly on my own, out of scope, out of your scope, how to hack into your system because usually the ways to hack into the areas are out of scope. And this is, I have a lot of problems with bug bounty. I'm always out of scope. It's, it's a problem. It's a... Uh, but also like how everything is connected and doing security architecture and putting security into areas before SOP. It's very important going from the beginning and talking together with all the suppliers. And this is like, we just need to work together. And I know this is a place that has lots of NDAs and lots of competition and lots of areas that uh, the, suppliers, the suppliers know more than the OEMs sometimes because they see all the OEMs and the OEM sees only itself. So sometimes you need to look at the different suppliers, you, do, you need to talk with them, you need to communicate and to be open in security. So I don't know how much time we have, but if we have questions, I cannot hear nothing. Yeah, there's a microphone or something or just like, I can answer this. This is actually, I'm, my focus, I came from all the pen testing applications and networks. And I don't have any knowledge in embedded at all. So I came to the company and like I tried to understand how to do it. So I have from robotics a bit of embedded knowledge. But then I have knowledge like reverse engineering is something that I just don't have. And for me now at the age of 35 to learn reverse engineering, it's with a kid and everything, it's almost impossible. So you need to have different capabilities in the team. So I have... I have a pet reverse engineer always beside me, so I can always ask him, and uh, I found this interesting area, can you help, or I find, found this binary, can you help me? And this way, when you have, you need to, like, I, I like to know a lot, and I, I like to look from above, but then there's places I cannot go, and you have to have, like, people, so in this industry, you have to know OT, you know, you need to know a bit of, a, like, SCADA, and when you go into scatter stuff, this is a different perspective. 
but you also need to know embedded uh, security. So for once, sometimes we see an embedded board and the supplier just removed some of the chips. So we need to guess which chips to put back on. And to guess which chips to put back on, it's like, I don't have this capability. So I go to my hardware guys. And to do reverse engineering, uh, I go to my reverse engineering. Also for new stuff, uh, like I'm in this world that I came, even from my one year vacation, I came back, everything moved, everything changed. I have lots of like uh, uh, different SSRF vulnerabilities and different uh, subdomain takeovers and stuff that I, I didn't know when I, was, uh, when I was studying this. So you always need to be on your edge and learn stuff, but also have this team because you will never be able to know everything. Yeah. Uh, no, so, so this is like an example from a four-day assessment only. So we were like crazy going to the targets, going in low level, like a, not a shallow level, not, not going deep into stuff, just seeing that we found going on. And so you don't have time. Uh, and it's a very important thing to understand as an OEM, as a, what kind of assessment you want. If you want a one-week assessment, but so you will find like lots of uh, shallow stuff but you will get a feeling of what's interesting for you, and then you need to deep dive into different areas. So let's say the, bar, the barcode, you want to make sure that if somebody hacked into the system, he can't do nothing, or you can't have a fraudulent uh, barcode that can hack into the system by some kind of putting a dash or one. Um, so, yeah. yeah I, next time I'll find it, I'll try. <laughs> yeah. Over there, update stuff. Yeah, of course. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, I cannot talk about it. So, yeah. Any any more questions? Yeah. Yes, this is. Uh, I, I'm working with the OEMs directly, so they're reported. This is why I didn't put anything that is. I didn't put any names, any clues, any way. I have so much more I want to tell you. And this is like a big problem in this industry. I cannot. Um, it's a problem. I don't know how to solve it if someone can help me. Or I don't know how to make the research better. It's, I have vulnerabilities uh, from uh, different bug bounties I've done in the past for different OEMs. And it's, I'm already waiting eight months for stuff to, for them to acknowledge it and fix it. And I'm sure that even there are much more, there are two year plans and stuff and it's basic. Like if I go to Google and, uh, and uh, give the same thing, they will fix it in two days. They just have this whole process and it's very hard for them to fix currently because it's not them. The OEMs don't do the stuff, they, the suppliers do it. So if I, if I give the OEM a problem and then LG is, uh, needs to fix it, they need to convince LG. And then there's a change request. And if after a change request, you need to convince them why it's security and it's such a long process at the end, it takes you so much time just to fix stuff. <laughs> no. No, so, no, so I, I don't know. There are capabilities, like you can access the servers. Sometimes the keys, and it, it depends on each company. I, I, don't, I don't want to go into the companies that I know, so like, I don't know how to answer this. <laughs> yeah. In a political way. Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Thoughts of uh, experiences maybe? What you thought? Uh, yeah. I need. Mean. 
Yeah. So Tesla has a bug bounty program, and FCA has one, and I think GM has one, and who else? Trying to think. You guys don't have one yet. Um, I don't know. Maybe soon there will be better, but part, uh, most of the bug bounties are non-disclosure. And this is too bad. This is like one problem. It's, uh, you have this bug bounty, but it's a full non-disclosure bug bounty. So even after they fix, you cannot tell, say nothing about it. You cannot. Yeah, I think so. It's also, you mentioned China. For instance, China has different servers usually. Usually there's different requirements. So in, when we have like vehicles in China, so they go to different backends and they behave differently. So this is a, when they're verifying and looking at security, you don't know, you, every country is different. Like China is a very different, but also Europe is different than the United States. So you have different chips over and even different software, different hardware, different backends, everything is like different. And, but everything is still connected some way in different areas, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming. <laughs>